Let's open up in a word of prayer. Dear Father, once again, we're thankful for an opportunity to look into your word, and we're trusting that uh, you indeed might teach us this evening, and that we might hear from you and the truths of your word that you want communicated to us. So we just pray that you might enable us to share your word in an effective manner, and now allowing your Holy Spirit to take that and to apply it to each of our lives. We pray in your name. Amen. We've come into the book of Acts. If you want to have your Bibles open to the chapter 8, that's where we're going to be beginning this evening. But uh, the book of Acts is more than just a history lesson. And trust that as you are coming uh, these evenings, that you're seeing that the book of Acts is more than just explaining the early days of the church. It's explaining and uh, setting the Holy Spirit's role in the beginning and the establishment of the church. And also, not just the early days, but the Holy Spirit's role in our lives and in the church for today. If we do not have the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the church will not grow, the church will not be where it is uh, and cannot be where it is, apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because if you were to look into the book of Acts, and I, sorry, in the book of John, and I believe it's John chapter 6, unless the, unless the Holy Spirit draws the person, then they will never come to Christ. And so your salvation is intrinsic upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And do we realize that and the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Too many of us just see him as somebody that works miracles, somebody that works uh, special acts of God. The Holy Spirit is much more important to that. And even in our descriptions so far, we are just beginning to open up the whole ministry of the Holy Spirit to you. And so you're going to have to continue on into Romans and into the epistles to find out all that the Holy Spirit actually does in our lives. And so trust that you will get excited for that as we move along in this whole study. God the Holy Spirit is vital in our lives because we're in a spiritual battle as well where we'll face persecution. And right now many of our brothers and sisters around the world are persecuted unto death. We too may pay this price, so let's begin to count the cost and prepare accordingly. And uh, yeah, you don't have to read the news very far to find out to all the places around the world that the... Uh, or the believers are being persecuted. Northern, North Korea would be a chief one of that. But also trust that you are realizing from John 15 and verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Do we realize that? Or do we still believe that, you know, I have some of my own strength that I only need to call upon the Lord when all of a sudden I get into a tight jam? Or do we realize that every part of life needs to be done and needs to be operated in the power of the Spirit and in the power of uh, of his uh, enablement. Romans 7 verse 18 says, nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Do we realize that nothing good dwells in me? And that uh, apart from him, you can't. So trust as you begin ministry or as you begin your day, you're seeking the enablement of the Holy Spirit for you to operate in the role that God calls you to operate within. So in these lessons, we've been kind of looking at some of the persecution the early church went through. And, and I think in one of the previous lessons, we looked at the death of Stephen. And we have never seen it in our lifetime, somebody that's been stoned to death. Like how brutal and, and devastating that particular death was. And, and the thing is that Stephen isn't the only believer. Down through the, down through the history of the church, many believers have paid the ultimate price for the sake of the gospel. And we need to understand that. But the reality is that what Satan means for evil, God always turns around for good. And again, this is this high view of God that we need to have. This We need to know who our God is in going forward. God uses that, that persecution, uses the evil to advance his kingdom. Now, there was an early um, church father, a leader said this. He said, kill us, torture us, grind us to dust. Your injustice is proof that we're innocent. The oftener we are mown down, the more in number we grow. And so here's the truth. We are in the minority as believers. Yeah, we've sat and we've been protected here in Canada, but the reality is that many of our brothers and sisters in Christ have paid that ultimate price. And you know something that their faith unto death was a clear and powerful testimony. It could not be denied. And God has used it to advance his kingdom going forward. And you know what? As a result, like really what we're enjoying today is because of our brothers and sisters in Christ have paid that price. Do we understand that? Do we appreciate that, and do we pray for them? And so as we come into uh, chapter 8, does someone want to read the first four verses of chapter 8? Whoever finds it, just go ahead and read it. The first four verses of chapter 8. 
Paul was there giving approval to the death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church of Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. The godly ones were afraid of Stephen, and more deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy them. The church, going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Right, so notice what takes place immediately after Stephen's death. The original language implies that this was brutal cruelty to both men and women alike. Yet in verse 4 we read how this persecution backfired on Satan and how did God, how did God turn evil into good. As you're walking through this and as you're looking at the, as you were living in the city and you were scattered, you would think, where is God in the midst of this? And how would you answer that? So put yourself, put yourself in the shoes of our brothers and sisters in Christ, early church. They're, they're, they're like t- uh, 10, 15 years into their journey as believers, and all of a sudden everything explodes on you. What are you thinking? Must have made a mistake, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that might be. But how did he turn evil into good? as we read this account here for well it scattered the believers scattered the believers wow different audiences and so what what does acts 1 8 say that uh i can't read that yeah after the holy spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses where wow so up to this time where would the gospel witness been primarily centered yet? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And now what was God doing? Moving them out in that uh, further pursuit, right? Satan thought he'd killed the church, but instead God used it to spread the gospel further than ever before. The church started in Jerusalem, but now it was all over the world. And God used the event in Acts 8.1 to fulfill his plan from Acts 1.8. Please note how some fled persecution and others stayed to endure it this is where you follow the leading of the holy spirit so in the midst of persecution do we seek the lord's leading what does he want us to do and how and where does he want us to be because we notice that in verse one where do the apostles stay the apostles scatter no they didn't they stayed where they stayed in jerusalem but everybody else scattered so again there's not a one size fits all in this persecution one wasn't more spiritual than the other but again following the leading of the holy spirit Now, as we jump into this particular lesson, the reality is that we have truths that we need to learn from our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ in the early church. See, we're comfortable here, but the reality is that this is, we're living, we're living in a very unnatural um, point in the Christian, in the Christian world, because every other believer in Jesus Christ has always experienced persecution. And so we can't take this, our peace, for granted. We need to learn from them. We need to begin preparing. What is it going to look like? How are we going to handle persecution when and if it comes? And again, we don't pursue persecution, but the reality is that we have an enemy, don't we? And so we need to know the truth of God's Word, and we need to learn from our brothers in Jesus Christ. But the reality is, as we see in verse 4, not only do they scatter with the gospel, but as we go into this lesson, it's also going to, it's also going to confront some of their cultural biases. They're very, the church is very Jewish at this point in time, and God is going to begin expanding the horizons in ways that they didn't even know about, in ways that they hadn't even considered. And they're going to begin to realize the truth from, first, uh, from Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For the gospel is the power of God to who? To Yet to salvation for? everyone who believes for the jew first and also for the gentile so here's where we're going to go tonight so persecution advances the church to the outcast and the sorcerer and to the one from the south so number one to the outcast and the sorcerer is the first point where we're going the holy spirit directed the believers as they fled persecution so let's continue on in our reading into verses uh chapter uh, eight verses four and five now those who were scattered went about preaching the word Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And so who is Philip? Who is this Philip that is mentioned here? Okay. Do you believe it's one of the apostles? The apostles were, stayed in uh, Jerusalem, didn't they? I think he was one of the 
one of the uh, uh, lead or became one of the leaders, but one of the people chosen as a deacon to help look after the widows that were being neglected. Very good. Yeah, so he was one of the deacons who was called to uh, look after the widows. Now, not being Jewish, we don't appreciate the implications that Philip went down to the city of Samaria. I'm not sure if you realize when you're looking at, uh, when you're reading the Word of God, when it always it talks about people going from Jerusalem, it always talks about them going down. If they're heading for Jerusalem, it'll always tell you that they're going up to Jerusalem. Just that Jerusalem was at a higher elevation, everywhere else was lower elevation. So when they talk about somebody leaving Jerusalem, they're always talking about somebody going down. So not being Jewish, we don't appreciate the implications that Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed Christ there. But what did this mean for Philip? As they're starting to be scattered, now especially with the Samaritans, what's the relationship between the Jewish people and the Samaritans? Oh yeah, there was a lot of racism, wasn't there? That was unclean. Imagine they probably even described as dogs. What a degrading term and reference to these people. But Jews would never associate with the unclean Samaritans for they're a mixed race. As we would say in Papua New Guinea, they're Hopkos people. Mm -hmm. So in this light, so again, putting ourselves in this situation, Philip is going beyond what he'd ever considered before going to a people that he would never have associated before. And we saw that earlier as Jesus took his disciples into Samaria as well, right? So let's keep going and notice Philip's obedience and boldness, verses 5 to 8. So let me read verses 5 to 8. So think about this. So God the Holy Spirit empowered uh, uh, Philip to do what? Empowered him to do what? Heal. Yeah, heal. Yeah, what else? Other miracles. Other miracles, cast out demons. Why? What's God doing here? Why, why would God allow or God empower Philip in this particular miraculous signs? What's God doing here? Tremendous witness of the power of God. Absolutely especially as we consider what's, what's going to come, uh, come later on. But notice his emphasis, what he leads. He went down to Samaria and did what? And did miracles. Is that what it says? What does God's word lead with here? Yeah, preach the gospel. And so the gospel is the purpose. The gospel is the mandate. Now the miracles are there as the supporting um, what God is calling Philip to do. And so let's continue on to verses 9 to 13. Someone want to grab verses 9 and read to verse 13? Now for some time a man named Simeon had practiced sorcery. Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called a great power of God. Oh, me, Down to verse 13. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. So who is this Simon guy? A sorcerer. A sorcerer. Wow. What an occupation for their city. If you wanted something uh, foretold or whatever, guess who you went to? And isn't it interesting that uh, in this setting, there was a person like this. This was a, a power encounter between the living God and a worker of the enemy. And so we're going to talk more of that in the coming lessons. But uh, as, as God sought and the Holy Spirit sought to lead with the gospel into Samaria, who was already there ahead of that gospel coming? Opposition, right? And what's often ahead of us as we seek to share the gospel as well. And do we see why then God led Philip with the miraculous signs? Because again, what was there, what was there in front of him? What was there, what was there ahead of him? Was a man through, um, through, the, through evil was actually performing incredible signs and wonders? 
We actually had a demonic shaman, a sorcerer in our village, in, in the village of Lele. He would come into the village and say, somebody's going to die. He didn't say who, when, where, what, why, how. Somebody died, and guess what he said? See, I told you, and everybody just, they could worship the man and, and called on him for everything. And so the power that he had in our village was astonishing. And we see some of that from the text here is the power that Simon had uh, in Samaria up until that point. Because what does it say there? How do they view, how do they, how did the, the Samaria view um, Simon? Yeah, so they were attributing as some, great, as, as some great power. And so again, God confronted, God overcame, didn't he? Now, stop and think about this for a second. Philip is not one of the apostles, right? He's just one of the deacons. He's just one of the ones who waits on tables. And then all of a sudden, uh, uh, Philip comes up here to Samaria and he has this incredible ministry and to a ministry beyond the scope of the Jews. Again, as we understand from the text and from the text of God's Word, this was a first advance. This was a first advance beyond the Jews. What is the church going to say? Especially the, Jew, the church is very Jewish and they have, they have some strong stigma, stigmatism against the Samaritans. What's the church going to say? Do you think Philip went to Jerusalem and said, hey guys, do you think it's okay for me to, to go to the Samaritans? What's the apostles going to say? Are they, going to, are they going to honor this? Are they going to come and poo-poo it? What, what do you think? This is a very real situation. You've just, Phil, you're Philip, you've just put your neck out and you've just advanced the gospel to somebody that never... Well, you quit laughing over there, Gary. Um, you asked me to keep you awake, so there you go. You're welcome. See? No extra charge. But think about this going forward. This is a very real situation as God's Word is going forward, and we need to appreciate that. So now, what are the apostles going to say? Verses 14 to 17. Verses 14 to 17. Who wants to read that for me? When the apostles... Verse 17 as well. Okay, so what's the apostles' response? What's the apostles' response? Should Philip have been worried? No. So what does this, what does this say about the apostles? Here's one of their underlings, goes and advances the gospel, not with their permission, and beyond the cultural boundaries. And so what's the, what does this say about the apostles? What does it say about their leadership? They were, supportive. they were supportive, right? They weren't threatened here. They went down to encourage. They went down to, to but there's still an authority there, right? St- they've come to observe. They've come to see, haven't they? And again, uh, to stand with it. Their authority wasn't threatened as one of the disciples advanced the, gospels, uh, advanced the gospel without their permission, as it were. But here's a question. Why did the Samaritans have this special outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Why is it different than all the other believers who receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of their salvation? We believe, and we're going to look into this in a little bit further, but we believe that the apostles needed to witness the coming of the Holy Spirit in order to understand that the gospel was also for the Samaritans. This was earth-shattering stuff for the church. And so God, by His grace, is giving a witness to the apostles of what He's doing. Now, here's a quote and I, I like this. If God had not withheld his spirit until the Jerusalem apostles came, converts on both sides of the cultural barrier might have found Christ without finding each other. And again, I built this William Larkin. And so again, God in his grace is sovereignly working out his plan, building his church, bringing his church together, not fragmented, but bringing it together in a very powerful way from the very beginning. So let's look and see how it came together as we continue on into verses 18 to 24. Someone want to grab verses 18 through to 24? Of bitterness 
Simon asked, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. So in this passage, we find a sorcerer who lost his position of power and profit. And although he was baptized as a believer, it seems like he was simply interested in acquiring the greater power and prestige. This reveals Simon's heart of unbelief and, he conde- and he's condemned for it. He seems more scared than repentant. So think about this. Think, think of the, outpower, the, op- the outpowering of, or outpouring excuse me, of God's Spirit here in the Samaritans. Again, we're seeing so many dynamics here of how did God use this and use it to reveal a false believer, right? Potentially, of what was taking place. Now remember amongst the men, and there was a there was a young girl that was sick up in the hamlet up behind us, and they were the only believers in that in that hamlet. And many of us were praying. There was a demonic shaman that was incredible pressure on those early believers, insisting that they take them to him to, for the healing. But they said no, and they they stood true to the truth of God's word. And and we thought it would be a great power encounter for God to demonstrate His power over the over this demonic shaman. But you know what? The girl died. But you know what, as, 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 as we were sitting and, and counseling the, the believers there, and the, the mother asked me soon after the child had died, an hour, a couple hours after the child died, she said, where was God? How come God didn't hear her, heal her? Thousands were praying. And the first thought that came to mind was, didn't he? Well, I said, well, what do you mean? I said, didn't your daughter trust Christ as her Savior? Where is she today? Is she ever going to get sick again? Is she ever going to die again? And so the mother was consoled and, 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 um, and believed the truth of God's word, but the father was revealed to be an unbeliever that was just placating, just like potentially Simon was doing. So again, God in his wisdom knows what he's doing, and we can continue to go forward trusting that God knows best in all, in all that he's doing. So early in Jesus' ministry, so think about this, excuse me, um, God turns persecution designed as evil to advance his kingdom. And there's the truth that we're looking at it. Persecution advances the gospel to the outcast and to the sorcerer. Now early in Jesus' ministry, Jesus spent time with an outcast. Who was that outcast that Jesus spent time with? Do you remember? The Samaritan woman, right? So think of, the, think of the cultural barriers that Jesus broke as he spent time with this woman, his love for an outcast Samaritan, a woman with little value of, of that day, and as an adulterer. Okay, this is Jesus' heart here as he's going forward, his desire to rescue everyone regardless of race, regardless of choices, regardless of income or position, his personal nature to meet people where they're at, to call them to a relationship with him. His all-knowing and being able to reveal the private sin of of an individual. His authority to call sinners to account. And so we see this, we see God's grace and His mercy as He's working and His heart for the outcast. And so the disciples going forward, so think about that, as Philip went to the Samaritans, do you think the disciples were remembering this event? Do you think God was bringing this to remembrance? Because Peter and John were there when Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman. They saw what Jesus had done. Now what's even more interesting is what the Samaritan woman has said in John 4, 25. I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Now do you see how God... So here's the people anticipating, waiting for the Messiah. And now Philip comes into the scene and what does Philip bring to them? the fulfillment of what they've been longing for. Do we see the hand of our God in this? In these divine moments of what he's doing. With this this desire for the deliverer, is it any wonder there is a sorcerer in Samaria? Where God is at work, Satan seeks to counterfeit, disclaim, distract, and deceive. And so as we look at our own society, we can see some of the evidences of what Satan is about, seeking to get our society into other things. Fill their lives with busyness. Isn't that often what we, are, we see people? If people today are busy every day of the week. They're taking their children here. They're taking their children there. They're taking this. They want to do this. They want to do that. And they don't have, we don't have time for anything. And yet we are the people, the most, the most uh, leisure-orientated people, but yet we're the busiest people today. P- Peter and John overheard some of Jesus' dialogue with the Samaritan woman. So as the Samaritans came to Christ, do you think Peter and John were looking to see if the Samaritan woman is among the believers? We're not told. But I wonder if they were looking around as they laid hands on them and said, is this the one? I think she might. No, no, sorry, that she, no, she's different. I wonder if they were looking for that Samaritan woman. Do you think they remembered Jesus' words about the Samaritans? Look at the fields, they are, white, sorry, they are ripe for harvest. And all of a sudden now they get that flashback, so, 
He did say that, didn't he? Well, maybe this is what he was referring to here, that they were ripe, and now the harvest has come. Here's something I just was thinking about. Look at verse 17. Then Peter and John did what? In the process of all of this, verse 17, what did Peter and John do? They placed their hands on. Do you, do, you, do you realize the significance? Like we just read that, oh, yeah, no big deal. They put their hands on them. But what did this mean for Peter and John? They had never touched the Samaritans before. They would be ceremonially unclean in this process, right? Do you see the work of God and what he's doing in the lives of, of Peter and John going forward? And they didn't have hand sanitizer back then. <laughs> But this is the work of God as he's bringing these people together as brothers and sisters in Christ, one in Christ, and going beyond that. Let's look at this special outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What, what, what does this mean? See, in the book of Acts, there is only four accounts where the Holy Spirit comes with an incredible outpouring of his Spirit. Four different accounts of all of the thousands that came to Christ. There is only four accounts. Every other believer received the Holy Spirit at the moment of the rescue without fanfare. So only four, opera, only four times was there incredible for, uh, fanfare. The first, was, the first was Pentecost, wasn't it? And it seems like the remaining three are all flashbacks, are all hit, uh, references back to that first great event. And by it, God is suggesting that God is embracing all peoples into one family. Let's look at this here, the four accounts. Um, in Acts chapter 2, the first Jewish believers received the Holy Spirit. This might have looked like a Jewish Pentecost because it was primarily Jews or those who had converted to Judaism had, come, had become Jewish that were now the pouring of the Holy Spirit. Now in Acts chapter 8, the first Samaritan believers received the Holy Spirit. This might have looked like a Samaritan Pentecost. Again, it's not, it's not another uh, true Pentecost because guess what? The first coming in Acts chapter 2 opened the door for every believer, but there's an outpouring of the Spirit on this other people, the Samaritans. And again, it's a revelation to these Jews that these are part of our family. These are one in Christ with us in Christ. Now in Acts chapter 10, we're going to see later on in a future lesson that the first truly Gentile believers, Cornelius, received the Holy Spirit. This might have looked like a Gentile Pentecost. Again, looking forward. Now in Acts chapter 19, is a little bit difficult to understand because as Paul comes to some of John the Baptist's disciples, he then puts his hand on them to also receive the Holy Spirit. And again, it's difficult to understand it in light of it, but as you follow it through, the suggestion is this might look like a Pentecost for John's disciples. And again, we don't really, it's hard to understand and appreciate all this taking place here. But with the prejudice between these peoples, between the Jews and the Samaritans and the Gentiles, and then all of this dialogue that's happening, is it possible to see that God by His Spirit is bringing His body together in a way that wouldn't naturally happen on its own? Questions on this? Thoughts on this? Again, there's lots of views. As I've presented here, there's a lot of different views about these four different accounts. And this is one perspective that's maybe different than maybe you've heard before. Or is this similar to what you've heard before? What do you think, Frank? Well, I'm just thinking of Acts 10, where, where Peter is speaking to the, these uh, Gentiles. And uh, as he speaks, I'm not quite sure, but it seems like he may have seen the Holy Spirit, uh, God anointing these people with the Holy Spirit. Well, there is, there, is, there is that sense, and we can, we, can flip, we can flip forward there if you want to. Um, you go down to Acts chapter 10, uh, verse uh, 45. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And so there's a, there's a sense from Peter that this is a revelation to them as Jewish believers. And so that's how we're interpreting it based on what God has revealed here. Yes. Absolutely. 
But again, bring God the Holy Spirit bringing unity to the body of Christ. Where there have been division, cultural division, God by His Spirit is uniting. Powerful, isn't it? Keep going down. So let's think about how God works to advance His kingdom. He'll do it in ways that will challenge us, even use persecution. He has commanded us to extend His gospel to all nations, which includes our outcasts, whether they be theologically, culturally, or personally the way that God is moving the gospel around the world. And so, if you are Philip, who are your outcasts? And if you were put in Philip's place or you brought Philip into our modern day, what would be the outcasts of today? Like, I don't know if God can reach those type people. Now, we might, if somebody questions us, we might, we might push back, but is there not sometimes some hesitancy in our mind that could God really reach, say, somebody from the LGBTQ uh, community? Like, we start to, sometimes we can start putting up some walls. Gary and I were talking about this today. We start putting up some walls there that, oh, yeah, we almost, there's some doubt in our mind that God's Word can't reach them, or, or we kind of put these walls up between us because God's Word is, is probably not going to be effective there, and so then we kind of put these barriers there up, don't we? Maybe you've got some others that you're thinking about. Well, they've got to get, get, get saved first, maybe, or they need to clean themselves up before they can uh, be reached, right? What about the street people? What about the homeless? No, that's for somebody else, maybe. How comfortable are you that God might use you to go beyond your boundaries to reach these outcasts? Are we prepared for God to lead that way? Are we willing, asking God to lead that way? Or God, lead me to somebody that's nice and cleaned up already. It's pretty comfortable to sit here and say, yes, I will, absolutely. Oh. But when the reality is, comes, comes, comes close, or when, we, when I pray in private, uh, what is my God really those people? I, I, I don't want to be a part of it. And it's hard and necessary. Just an example. I, I have had the opportunity to deal with a lot of Hutterite people. And where they have the widest spectrum of how they treat others and how, or how they place themselves. And uh, Peter just told me something here a couple. She'd like to share it with you now. Oh. <laughs> 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 the car's going to be a little frosty on the way home, though. <laughs> uh, well, I was shopping, Christmas shopping today, and I figured I'd stop for lunch, and there was a Hutterite lady right beside me. And I just said, oh, do you celebrate Christmas? Like, do you buy your children something? And she says, uh, yes, we do, but we celebrate Jesus Christ. And I said, oh, so do I. I said, I'm a Christian. How about you? Are you Christian? She goes, yes, and so we chatted a little bit. So Just as easily as that. Taking opportunity, like, mm-hmm. people that God puts in our path. But then using something natural for Christmas yeah. to ask the question. Awesome. Awesome. Taking down those barriers. But often then we would have to define what is a Christian. And what do you understand a Christian to be? Because you could probably mention that to a, a Mormon, and they would say, yeah, I'm a Christian. But their whole definition, their whole theology structure is totally different. And so nowadays we have to define what we mean by what is a Christian. Yeah. But even a true believer, they will still say, oh yeah, I'm a true believer. So we have, to go a little bit, we have to go a little bit further. Okay, so what do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe that he came to do? And why did he have to do what he did? Or some other questions, you've got to be a little bit more probing, right? Well, sometimes, you know, maybe we're invited to a block party. They have alcohol. Mm-hmm. Why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we know what you. I knew. I knew what you meant. Your husband was. We bring our own. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thanks for the clarity. But we had a. You know, we every year in Papua New Guinea we would have a, a missions conference for us on the base. We brought a speaker in from the states, and as he was walk, as he was uh, leaving after the conference. 
he was in the waiting room of the airport there. And he sat down, he started in his mind, I think he was sharing the gospel or finding out what these people were, where they were at. And it didn't take him very long where he was affirming them and their faith and that they were fellow believers of his. But uh, he didn't understand the culture, he didn't understand what he was communicating and all that sort of thing. But he left probably the, the believing that uh, these people were believers. And so we have to be awfully careful, especially when we're going across cultural uh, differences that we understand and define what a believer is. So on the flip side, God's going to use some of the Phillips in our church to reach across where we feel comfortable. There's going to be some within God's going to use, like here's Philip, and so now the apostles are coming to see what Philip is doing, going across boundaries here. Now what about the Phillips in our church? What if God was to call one of, one of the Phillips from our church to be a street evangelist, to be a TV evangelist, to reach out to a biker gang, reach out to, say, an LGBTQ a community, or th cross theological boundaries that we feel uncomfortable with? How would we support them, or would we support them? Or is that just taboo? See, that's not what that's, but that's not what we're saying. But you're right. There's a very good point to ask because, again, we just don't go to whatever means to get a following. We're going there to live Christ, to present Christ, as Philip did, went to Samaria. He's not compromising truth. He's just going to places that the church would never have gone before. And the church would have been snaky. And we're going to see that going forward in some of these upcoming lessons of how this pushed the buttons in the church. And see, it's one thing for somebody to go out and share the gospel. What about bringing them in? Oh, that's another whole story, right? They better not dare come in. You know, you can go out. That's, you know, that's hard enough to get to that point. But to actually bring them in? What would we look like if all of a sudden ministry to uh, those marginalized started happening within our walls? Or should we be preparing, be, be prepared for that? Is God asking us to, to open up our eyes to realize that, yeah, we've been pretty comfortable perhaps, that we need to start considering this? Again, God's going to be gracious in all this as he was gracious in the early church. Because think about that. As you look at the timeline, how many years before, um, um, how many years, it's probably about eight years or so, where the church had primarily been Jewish and God allowed that and going forward. But God in his grace and his mercy has began pushing them out in ways that they didn't necessarily expect. And so we can trust God to lead us in this process, but what God is asking us is to check our own hearts. We just heard this last week that a church in Cambridge sought to effect the ministry into the Muslim community. And so they went and I think they had 100 used bikes that they fixed up. Some gentleman in their church was gifted in fixing bikes. And so he found 100 used bikes, fixed them up, and gave them to the Muslim community, the mosque. And they were praised from the whatever they call the pulpit or whatever in the mosque, in the mosque there for how they were blessed them with these bikes for their kids a way to reach out into the Muslim community. Another way, one of their public schools burnt down, and so they invited the public school into their church to use their church uh, rooms during the week. And so they thought they were just going to give it to them for three or four months. They actually stayed for three and a half years. <laughs> the public school in Ontario 
was in their church. And they as a church sought once a month to reach out to that public school with either pizza, hot dog night. They're just trying to find creative ways to reach out into their community, to reach out to those who are marginalized around them. And they're in a community that has the largest Portuguese Catholic community outside of Portugal, is in Cambridge, Ontario. And that's the community that they're ministering with in. And they're seeing the, the gospel move forward. And they're seeing people come to know the Lord. So here's another question. What if God advances the gospel with signs, wonders, power encounters, and dreams? Would we be okay with that? Again, just pu- I'm just pushing the buttons here, guys, tonight. I'm pushing the boundaries. But this is the truth of God's word. What would that look like if God brings that? We're hearing stories in the Muslim world where God's doing all of that, right? Could God not do that here? Yeah, it's absolutely true. Very. Sorry? Absolutely. Yeah. So again, we need to be aware because the, the enemy will come as an angel of light as well. But again, we just can't carte blanche say, no, God doesn't work that way today. We, as, as was said, we need to know the truth. But as God worked in the early church, God can still work today. And again, it's not going to move us beyond the, the confines of his word. We just need to understand what he's doing. Well, it's even interesting as I get rental cars each weekend, um, where we're getting rental cars from, they drive us back and forth. And, and so there's Muslim and Hindu that, that are, the, are the drivers of the vehicles. And so it's interesting, the conversations has been started as we start asking, okay, what we're doing and why we're doing it. And, and again, we haven't gone very far, it's just building relationship. But again, truth is starting to be like, okay, where do you believe in? And so then this conversation back and forth going forward and building these relationships. But the reality is that, that God can use persecution to advance the gospel to the outcast and to the sorcerer. And again, this is the power of the gospel, isn't it? And this is God's heart and his desire for all peoples. Thoughts or comments on this before we take a break? I was just thinking about the outcast in this case, Simon. Why did God not kill him? And I fire that basically the same thing about money. Mm-hmm. It is. But again, aren't you thankful? That's just a management decision. We're just in sales. And I um, um, forget where we got that saying from, but I think it's really true that God is God, isn't he? There's the aspect of looking at the disciples. When, when uh, the guards and the soldiers and so on came for Jesus in the garden, they all fled. That was the pre-Holy Spirit mm-hmm. of the, of the uh, empowering. Whereas after they stood firm, mm-hmm. why did the, why did the uh, disciples stay in Jerusalem? Mm-hmm. Because they could. Mm-hmm. They were empowered to. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. And thereafter, the believers just being empowered to to build the church, to build the church, to teach, preach the gospel, and share with people. Mm-hmm. And they they stepped way out of bounds for the Jew, for what was Jewish. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. How is this encouraging? So here's the apostles. They've never been this way before. What God is asking them to do is beyond anything that they ever considered. These are fishermen. These are a tax collector. These are men with, uh, from Galilee, as it were, without much education. That's how they were viewed. But think of what God is asking them to do and how he's leading them in that. And how is that encouraging for us today? 
we may, God's going to take us places that we've never been before. That's where I'm living right now, and I'm overwhelmed. Okay, God, how is this all impossible? But the reality is, as God was faithful for the apostles, will he not be faithful for us? Can we not trust him to lead us and, 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 to, and to guide us? We don't, have to force, we don't have to force his agenda. We don't have to force this, but we need to follow him as to where he's leading, right? He's a good, good father, and he will lead and guide and direct as we're going forward. <laughs> well, let's go on to our second theme this evening, and it's uh, dealing with the persecution advances the gospel to the one from the south. And so we're getting back here to Philip and He's just shared the gospel to the Samaritans, and it seems like a large number came to Christ. Who would now need discipling? In this light, let's read what happens next. If all of a sudden this is the beginning of a church plant, let's say, and then all of a sudden, as we come to verse 26, let's read it. And now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. What a time for the angel of the Lord to step in to a beginning ministry like this. If at all possible, what kind of thoughts would be going through your head if this would hap have happened to you? Have we really established something here yet? Now I'm working on. Right, I got work to do here, right? Yeah. Like, exactly. find somebody else. I'm sure there's somebody else out there that's got to be just as qualified. Where's those other six from, that were brought in as deacons? What are they doing? I bet they're sitting on their hands, aren't they? <laughs> it's about time for them to get up, get going. And notice that he tells them to go down to Jerusalem, over to, and who's in Jerusalem? Who's in Jerusalem? Who stayed in Jerusalem when the persecution happened? Disciples. The disciples. So why is he having to go from Samaria down? Why not just send the disciples? Wouldn't that be more efficient? Let's argue with this angel a little bit, right? My goodness, you've given me a ministry to do here. I still have lots of work to do. There's still new believers here. They need somebody to teach them, disciple them of all, of all things. You know, go into all the world, or you know, we're to be disciples of all nations. Okay, God, I'm fulfilling your will on this, but now you're asking me to move somewhere else. Would Philip almost wonder if this angel is, a, is, a, is the enemy coming as an angel of light? Seems completely out of the blue, doesn't it? Now, sort of the yes. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. We're not told what Philip's thoughts are, but even thinking about that, all Philip is told is to go south. He's not told where he's necessarily where he's going. He's told to go south to the road, to the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. He's just sent on a direction. This wasn't, this wasn't just a day stroll for him. He's not told who he's meeting, why he's going, how long he's going to be, what he's going to take, and what he's going to find when he's there. He's just told to go. Go so, to the local rental agency and rent a nice car. Make sure it's got air conditioning. You're going to need that. But none of that is given. So we don't, we don't know what Philip's thoughts are. I'm just, I'm just uh, 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 surmising there. But notice Philip's response and the outcome, verses 27 to 29. So let me read verses 27 to 29. So think about those. Here's Philip. He's walking along, and he does, as the Ethiopian comes up to him, he doesn't even know that this is the person until what does the Spirit do? Tells him to go, right? To speak to, speak to him, even, even at that particular moment. And so, again, this is faith and obedience in action. So Philip runs to the chariot. I'm not sure how fast this chariot was going, but just the act of running up to the chariot. I'm sure the chariot can go a little bit faster than a person can run. So I'm not sure if all of a sudden he got some legs on him and he became like Elijah when <coughs> Elijah uh, beat the chariot back into the city. But uh, we'll have to ask him that someday. But Philip runs to the chariot in obedience to the Holy Spirit and hears him reading Isaiah 53, the passage about the sufferings of the, of the deliverer. Philip then asks if he understands the passage to which the Ethiopian replies, no, please help me. We don't know how the Ethiopian converted to Judaism, and we especially don't know how he had a copy of Isaiah or was reading it just then. But God knew and orchestrated this meeting so this Ethiopian might hear the gospel. But then it also reminds us back into 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 
verses 1 to 13 with the Queen of Sheba. Could there have been a connection that way uh, to them uh, hearing or having some kind of presentation of the gospel or the truth? But uh, let's uh, read uh, verses 35 to 39. Chapter 8. If you got 35 to 39, go ahead and read it. Go ahead, John. Fair. Isn't that interesting? Where would that idea come up that here's water? Why can't I be baptized? What did they all discuss while they were in the chariot? When you share in the gospel, do you talk about baptism? Is that part of your conversation? Somehow it must have got into their conversation. Or where would he have gotten the idea from? Can you picture this divine moment? Here's a high-ranking government official from Ethiopia who came to Jerusalem. And I'm sure his little uh, chariot or whatever he was riding in wasn't the average man's chariot. Imagine it had a few little extras in it, a few little luxuries. Maybe it had leather seating in it. And maybe, you know, you had a nice stereo system or whatever in this uh, chariot or whatever. But I'm sure this chariot would have been decorated a little bit better than the average person's. And so here Philip, just a lowly deacon, and God asked him to go in and minister to a official like this. That'd be like all of a sudden, you know... Uh, Scott Moe coming to town and God asks you to share the gospel with Scott Moe or maybe even Justin Trudeau. Wouldn't that be an awful privilege to be able to do that? Truly God desires disciples from all nations and that's our all-knowing, loving, ever-present and attentive God that God moves us and asks us to move in unique uh, situations and this would have been a unique one for Philip. The Ethiopian responds in repentance and faith and is baptized on the spot to declare to all those in his group, that he's a Christ, a Christ follower. And so I'm sure as he traveled, it probably was not just a single chariot. If he was an important official, they probably would have been two or three maybe going along with them at that time. We're not sure. But if you're an important official going through strange, strange country, you wouldn't have gone, just gone by yourself. You probably would have maybe had security as well. But this Ethiopian responds in repentance and faith and is baptized on the spot to declare to all those in his group that he's a Christ follower. And now that the transaction was complete, the Spirit of God snatched Philip away to a different location. So here's this Ethiopian. He went to Jerusalem as an Old Testament Jew. How did he return? The same way? He went, he went back as a believer, right? And, and history, history surmises that this Ethiopian established a church in Ethiopia in southern Arabia, is what history would say. So what was God inviting this Ethiopian into? What was God inviting this Ethiopian into? Relationship? Yeah, absolutely. As equals with the other believers in Christ? Into the family of God? Absolutely. He's God's uniting His body across cultures. See, this whole account of the Ethiopian coming to faith in Christ is all of God. To God, the one from the south is as important as the thousands from the north. Are we seeing God's perspective here in going forward and, and how he looks at things? Asking Philip to leave those many that were coming to Christ to come to the one because that's how God views it. See, and this, this, this uh, uh, gentleman could have been from a different skin. Uh, it could have been black, could have been brown. And so all of a sudden we're now we're seeing the gospel go across race, racial barriers mm -hmm. into other cultural uh, settings. See, this would have shocked, again, this would have shocked the Jewish believers. Why? Because up until this point, their faith was primarily Jewish. The Jewish were restrictive, um, thinking, especially the Old Testament, they viewed themselves as God's chosen people. 
God had commanded them to extend the gospel to other cultures, but what did the Jews do? They began to restrict it, didn't they? They began to withhold it. They began to turn withinward, and if somebody wanted the truth of God's word, what did they need to do first? They had to become Jewish, didn't they? And even if an outsider became Jewish, did they have all the rights and the privileges of full Jew? No. They couldn't even go into all areas of the temple. There was a court of the Gentiles that they had to stay within. They talk about prejudice going forward. This was never God's intention. God desired that Israel would be his megaphone to declare the gospel, to scare the truth of God's word to all peoples. So what did Israel know about God's heart for all peoples? Or was this a new concept for Israel to get behind? Oh, I didn't know. Did God actually want us to share his truth with the nations was that god's intent is that what god intended from the beginning or was this a new development because they buried it for so many years all the people were equally created in god's image for relationship all peoples were placed in, Sa- placed in Satan's kingdom because of Adam. And all peoples were equally judged at the Tower of Babel. And all peoples would be blessed through Ab- Abraham. Therefore, all peoples are the focus of God's heart. Praise God, he loves all peoples the same. None is greater and none is lesser. Jesus died to pay for the sins of every people. And the Holy Spirit convicts every people so as to draw them to a right r- relationship with God. And as a person comes in humble repentance and faith, regardless of which culture, they become one with Christ and united with every other believer. We're equal. Whether they have black skin, whether they have brown skin, whether they have red skin, whatever skin color, whatever culture they come from, whatever every language that they are speaking, we're one in Christ. Do we realize that? See, this account of the Ethiopian also helps to answer another question that often believers have asked. What about that person in deepest, darkest Africa who never hears about Christ? Is there hope for them? So think of how God moved for this Ethiopian to draw him to Christ. So think about this. God has revealed his character and creation so that everyone is without excuse, regardless of where they live. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. God is present and promises to reveal himself if a sinner seeks. This was true for Abraham, wasn't it? Abraham did, wasn't grown up, didn't grow up in a Christian family, didn't grow up in a, in a God-fearing family. They were idolaters. But, God, but Abraham found the Lord, or God found him. Maybe it's a better way. Now it's true for the Ethiopian. Matthew chapter 7, 7, 8. What's it say? Knock and the door will be open. Seek and you will fine and so god has made this promise god who is everywhere present loving and gracious knows the heart of man who's responding to the truth of what god is revealing god the holy spirit communicates so that all cultures can understand god promises that every tribe tongue and nation will be represented around the throne revelations 5 20 so think about this so whether if we struggle with other cultures being united with them guess what we're going to celebrate with for all of eternity those from around the those from every tri- tribe tongue and nation aren't we so we probably better get used to it so persecution is still advancing the gospel today primarily as god uses us as believers but even if you look at the nation of china as you see the persecution has recently begun once again and the gospel is continuing to advance continuing to move forward across china <laughs> but some of us are waiting for an angel to appear to us and tell us to share the gospel with all peoples but what is wrong with this? You know, if all of a sudden, you know, God wants me to go to Africa, he's going to have to send an angel to tell me to get going to Africa, right? Or if God wants me to go here or there or wherever. What's wrong with that approach? Matthew 28, what's God command us as believers? Wait for an angel? Yeah, he's already told us to go, hasn't he? Basically, the, the wording there is, as you go, be making disciples. Well, we're waiting for the cultures to come to us. Mm. Well, God's having to bring the cultures to us, maybe because the church hasn't gone. Remember, God, the Holy Spirit, advances the gospel through us, so we should be preparing to share Christ and obey Christ as he gives opportunities. 
Each morning we prepare by studying His Word, praying for those around us, and by asking God to make us alert to His leading. Is that how we approach our day? Do we ask, do we begin our day <coughs> saying, God, would you allow me an opportunity to be able to speak, live for you in the setting that you call me, whatever that setting is? Whether that be going out shopping, whether that be as, yeah, you're st stopped at some restaurant talking to your neighbor, whatever that may be. But do we, are we intentional about those opportunities? Do, are we praying for those opportunities? Or are most of us is hoping that we never have something like that happen to us? We can prepare by taking the established training course to effectively share Christ with others as well, even cross-culture. So if you were to step into the whole training program that Establish has, part of that program is some uh, cultural... Uh, understanding and uh, that goes along with that as well so as we stop and think about how god led philip and the principle that god establishes there god established a principle that the one is as important as the thousands so here's a question why do we equate god's blessing with numbers why do we equate God's blessing? If thousands are coming to Christ, that's God's blessing. If just one comes to Christ, oh, well, yeah, God's moving, but man, he's really moving over here and we celebrate. So why do we play that game? Why do numbers matter to us? Why do numbers matter to us? Yeah, the way we measure success, right? But is it a right way to measure success? Because often, what are we celebrating? Look how many are coming to the Lord in my ministry. Like, really, aren't we, are we playing that numbers game? But like, we need to be like Philip, where we go at the bidding of God, whether it's one sitting at a coffee table or whether it's, that, whether it's hundreds. Again, in God's economy, there isn't, there isn't that difference, is there? See, we learned this last week that North America has a CEO mentality that we brought into the church. And we kind of structure our whole leadership around that kind of mentality. And so a CEO doesn't last long in his job if he doesn't have great returns for his investors or those who have, have uh, put uh, or invested money into his corporation. Just look at the whole sports uh, NFL. If you don't win four games in a row, you're done, right? We recently found that out. I think the, the Ravens just uh, uh, ditched their coach after uh, not winning the last four games. And some other teams have had three coaches so far this season already. <laughs> We have that mentality and we start believing that mentality. If you're not winning, then you're a loser, right? And if you don't have a big return, then you're not a very good uh, CEO. See, the reality is that every person, every person is important to God. And that's why we kind of, that's why we kind of emphasize this true. So persecution advanced the gospels to the one from the south because that one from the south is as important as the outcast and the sorcerer that came to Christ in Samaria. And we need to see this. And this is why the angels rejoice over thousands coming to Christ, right? Is that what it says? Everyone. Yeah, everyone, right? Everyone that comes to faith in Christ. So this means, what does this mean for us as we go forward? Do we compare ourselves? Do we compare ourselves? There was a situation in our family this last week where a person within the family was greatly influenced by, by my father-in-law. And the father-in-law thought, well, it wasn't of much value because it was just one. But it was, eternal, it was an eternal value in the life of that individual because of his faithfulness in that life. And he felt like he wasn't much of an evangelist. He didn't feel like he was much of a, of a, a value before God. But we've got to stop playing those games, don't we? We've got to stop focusing on the numbers, but rather to invest the talents that God has given us where He has placed us and leaving the results up to God is what He wants to do. We need to focus our energy to clearly share Christ and invest in the ones that God brings to us so that they in turn can share Christ with, who? with the next individual going forward so they can make more disciples. Because the truth is, as we look at it, persecution advances the gospel to the one from the south, and God celebrates that in going, in going forward. So let's wrap this up this evening. God's Word teaches us that He is sovereign, and His heart is to reach all nations with His gospel. And He will be faithful to complete His plan through us. And so God is as excited about the one as in the many. I'm not sure if you've ever been to Montana's when somebody's having a birthday there. Have you ever been there? All of a sudden they put the moose head on happy birthday, happy birthday, the big rack that goes on. Now can you imagine in heaven when somebody comes to 
to the Lord? What the noise or, or the excitement that it will be there? I'm not sure how often that probably happens quite a bit. Maybe they get used to it. I don't know. But we'll find out one day. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Romans 1.16 uh, states that. This is true because of the transforming power of God, the Holy Spirit. The gospel is for everyone, regardless of wealth, power, religion, prestige, education, culture, or demonic. No, no one is beyond the gospel. So we need to declare it boldly to everyone. The gospel is for everyone. There's one plan of salvation for everyone. And as we share the gospel, do it carefully to be sure it's understood. Don't make it about them. Them coming forward. Them saying a prayer. They must <laughs> recognize God's holiness, their helplessness and sin, and repentance and faith in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to be rescued. But, but despite this, there will be false professions like Simon. Be thorough and be wary of promising someone you said the prayer, so you're in. So... The reality is, as we go forward, we need to understand that the, that the gospel is not finished yet going forward to the world. And so Dan and I have a couple of scrolls here with us, and, and we just take this, John, and just hold on to the end and just start rolling it, and just roll it down here. And so on this particular scroll, and the next one that Dan has is, is not a duplicate, it's actually an extension well, of it. Here is line by line that mentions line by line peoples peoples, some hundreds, and you see numbers there. If you look down, some are 13,000, some are 10, but you see the numbers there. Here's line by line of peoples that are still waiting for the truth of God to come to them for the very first time. They have no portions of God's Word in their languages. There, to my knowledge, there is no one there in these particular languages. There is no known believers there amongst these peoples. And God says there's going to be some from around the throne standing there. So if we were to ask, where is God the Holy Spirit working today? I think we could fair say that this is where God the Holy Spirit is desiring to advance the gospel today. This is the need that are still in the world, still waiting for hear the truth of Jesus Christ. And so if we were to engage with anyone, we would engage with these peoples by praying, by giving, and by going. I'm not sure if there's a, uh, one of the tribes on there is called the Kaje, K-A-J, or J-E, I believe, or G-E on there. This past week, they heard the gospel for the first time. And there are believers amongst that language group today because of the gospel going into that tribe. Trust that you're excited that it is moving forward. But how can we get involved in the task of seeing the gospel reach into some of these groups as well? Whether that be by praying and uh, actively praying, by taking down some of those names and saying, God, I'm going to pray for these people on a regular, that somehow the gospel might move forward into those tribes, <coughs> or by going, or by uh, sending, or whatever means. So working in sync with the Holy Spirit's advance to the nations begins with prayer and must be undergirded with prayer all along the way. Praying begins with researching the unreached or misreached and praying that God would break down the walls against the gospel and send believers to them to reach them. Please take a picture of a section of the list with your phone to begin researching them to see what God is doing. You can research them on the internet or a resource like Operation World. And Dave here has this book, and it's available. I'm sure you can probably pick it up off of Amazon or Christian Books would have it or something like that, that you can do a lot of research on different groups that you have yet and the need to have somebody go. And so in this particular book, Operation World, it's country by country and the needs that are, the needs that are there. And so we can begin praying, can't we? Again, this is a responsibility that God has given to us that God would begin moving. Another way we can do is by giving, can't we? We can begin giving to see the gospel advance. And as we, as we research an unreached people here, as it's listed there, begin, okay, which missions are reaching out to them? What is the strategy there? How is God re researching? And that's where this book, Operation World, comes in. Now, we need to be wise in our research because not every mission is doing what they're actually saying. So be wise in how we're doing that and making sure that they're following through. Here's other ways we can support some that are actually advancing the gospel, and not just financially, but moral support. Those that are, those that are going, we can support them morally by, by reading their prayer letters and, and caring deeply, reading between the lines as to what they're sharing. Um, logistics support by handling the missionaries' home country needs as they're going. There's all kinds of responsibilities here at home. Um, communication support by active two-way communication. 
whether it's and then re-entry support i remember coming home so many times that there's so many major decisions we needed to make as we came back to canada we were just overwhelmed where to buy a vehicle how to get reset up on, on utilities, um, Wi-Fi, phones, all of those things that we take for granted that a lot of missionaries coming home have, have lost sight of. There's a, there's a resource that you can actually avail yourself as well, and, and some of this comes out of this book called Serving Ascenders. Uh, has anybody read this book, Serving Ascenders? A very practical resource for as a church that supporting what God is doing is so much more than just a dollar, so much more than just finances. It's actually these and many more. Um, if you want a simplified version, I kind of got a Cole's Notes or a reduced version of that if you want to read the, the shorter version of it, but a very powerful resource that will enable us to kind of see some of these principles going forward. Now, I want to show a video clip here. Um, and I hope this is gonna hope this is gonna work. Um, are you gonna work for me? Perspective. 
annually that Americans spend more money on Halloween costumes for their pets than get sent to World A. To summarize, only 3% of our missionary force, armed with only 1% of the missions given, is going out to reach the 2 million people who don't have access to the gospel. 2 billion people are still waiting for the good news of Jesus Christ. So here's a question for you. What are you going to do to change that? Humbling. And again, we can't take everything there, that no chance to hear the gospel. What about the Ethiopian? Again, God's not limited, is he? So not only do believers need to pray and give, but Jesus has also commanded us to go make disciples of all nations at home and abroad, ourselves, and encouraging others to do the same and to help us. God is bringing the nations to us. As we go, please be equipped uh, to do it thoroughly. Let me illustrate. If I had cancer of the brain, what would happen to me if my family doctor tried his hand at the operation? Would you want your family doctor doing that? I think he knows where the brain is. He probably might know how to make the first cut. But he goes in a little deeper. Or are you going to trust him? The same is true with crossing cultural barriers to share Christ. There has been too much damage in the world by well-meaning Christians who aren't equipped to handle the cultural challenges when sharing Christ. This is why we include lessons on cross-cultural communications in our established training and why we promote the specialized cross-cultural training through Ethnos Canada. If you want to know more, then you can speak to us. The Holy Spirit is advancing the gospel to all nations as we speak. But the question is, how will we engage? Each of us are disciples of Christ and called to make disciples of all nations at home or abroad, either by praying, giving, or going. And that doesn't mean that we need to be scared off. We can learn. We can go as learners and learn about culture. And then probably even the, the aspect of going, you can start by asking questions and getting to know what uh, some of the cultural aspects of your neighbors, whether they be from a different culture. Any thoughts, questions? And that's why we kind of, this book, if you want, there's extra copies back there that kind of tells more of the story and some of the needs and the opportunities that are there um, to be practically about praying and, and giving and going. Questions? What truth are we taking with us tonight? What truth are we taking with us tonight? Jesus cares as much for the one as he does for the multitude. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, you didn't know you were coming to a missions conference tonight, did you? <laughs> what truth are we taking with us? Jesus cares about the one as much as the multitudes. What other truth are we taking with us? The Holy Spirit will equip us to be yeah. to spread the word. Amen. Holy Spirit is sufficient, isn't he? We can trust him. So this isn't about this isn't about doing better, trying harder. This is about following in obedience, isn't it? Anything else? What truth are we taking with us? Well, let's close in a word of prayer and um, pray that you all each have a mer very Merry Christmas and uh, may God bless you as you celebrate Him in this season and uh, enjoy that with family and friends. So, Father, we thank You for who You are. Thank You for Your goodness and for Your grace. Thank You, Father, that You reached out to us to bring, uh, to bring the truth to us at whatever point it was in our lives. And Father, You've redeemed us, You've rescued us, and Father, You're about that in rescuing those who have yet to hear. Father, I pray that you would continue to stir us. I pray that you would continue to move us to see the needs and to be willing to, to step forward to support that, either praying, giving, or going. And Father, may you be glorified and uh, may you continue to advance your church and use us in that process, we pray. pray these things in your name. Amen.